روز دوشنبه اول مهر ماه 1398 جلسه ای در سازمان ملل متحد در شهر ژنو سوئیس برای بررسی نقض حقوق گروه های مذهبی در ایران در حاشیه چهل و دومین جلسه شورای حقوق بشر سازمان ملل متحد توسط مرکز اسناد حقوق بشر ایران برگزار شد سخنرانان این جلسه که در سازمان ملل متحد در شهر ژنو سوئیس برگزار شد عبارت بودند از پروفسور جاوید رحمان گزارشگر ویژه سازمان ملل متحد در امور حقوق بشر ایران خانم دایان علایی نماینده جامعه بهائیان در سازمان ملل متحد خانم باربرا مسترمند از انجمن جهانی پاسداشت حقوق بشر و آقای شاهین میلانی مدیر مرکز اسناد حقوق بشر ایران که برگزار کننده این اجلاس بود در ابتدا پروفسور جاوید رحمان گزارشگر ویژه سازمان ملل متحد در امور حقوق بشر ایران که از طریق اسکایپ در این جلسه سخنرانی می کرد در سخنان خود مجموعی از توصیه هایی را ارائه داد که رژیم ایران برای انجام تعهدات خود به عنوان امضا کننده منشور حقوق بشر سازمان ملل متحد و میثاقین باید از آن پیروی کند. in relation to discrimination and persecution of religious minorities and violation of their rights. Can, can you all hear me clearly? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, so I actually come to you. My most recent report for the General Assembly is now uh, publicly available. Um, this report uh, I shall be presenting to the third committee of General Assembly in October. Uh, this report uh, presents a detailed examination of the issues concerning ethnic and uh, linguistic and, and religious minorities. Uh, and um, in, in this presentation, I would just like to highlight a few points, obviously because of the shortage of time, I cannot go into so much detail. So um, I would just highlight a few um, key concerns that there exist in relation to uh, religious minorities. Uh, Iranian constitution and legislation discriminates against non-Muslims and against religious minorities by excluding them from most uh, of the prominent and influential positions. These are um, the Supreme Leader, as stated in Article 5 of the Constitution, the President of Iran, who must be a Shia Muslim, Article 15, uh, commanders of the Islamic Army, Articles 1144 and 147. Members of the Guiding Council, Article 91. And the Judiciary at any level, Article 163 and Law 1983 on the selection of judges. Now, on the political front, um, non Muslims are not eligible to attempt to perform seats through general elections. Instead, there are reserved seats allocated to, and that is only to recognize religious minorities. Non-recognized minorities, for example, the Baha'is or Christian converts, are excluded from both contesting or participating in the elections, and are therefore ostracized from all political processes. According to Article 13 of the Constitution, only the rest in Jewish and Christian Iranians are uh, all the recognized religious minorities. In fact, that means uh, the exclusion of um, well over 350,000 uh, 350, Baha'is and roughly or uh, even more number of Christian converts, about a million Yaristans and four million Sufis. The absence of uh, constitutional legal recognition for non recognized minorities. And entails denial of fundamental human rights for their followers. For example, uh, there is an inability for the next of kin to claim blood money, diya, or kisas, that is retribution in kind. 
Article 14 of the Constitution denies human rights for any person who, I quote, conspired or acted against Islam and the Islamic Republic of Iran. And therefore, the availability of fundamental human rights are contingent upon satisfying the criteria of not conspiring or acting against Islam and the Islamic Republic of Iran. Article 19 of the Constitution does not mention religion as a prohibiting criterion for discrimination, thereby sanctifying discrimination in law and in practice against religious minorities. Iranian civil code also reflects discrimination um, in various ways, for example, by barring non-Muslims from inheriting property from Muslims. If a non-Muslim leaves a Muslim heir, the Muslim heir is entitled to the entire inheritance, including the share of the non-Muslims. There is also a discrimination in sexual offenses on the basis of religion, since there is mandatory death penalty for non-Muslims in cases of adultery and homosexuality, as opposed to uh, 100 lashes applicable to Muslims. Religious minorities face difficulties in employment, as is reflected in the golden age requirements, with the test that applicants adhere to and have knowledge of Islam and loyalty to the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, non recognized religious minorities, particularly many of the Baha'is and Christian converts, have been excluded from higher education and from universities uh, on the pretext that their files are, quote, uh, incomplete. Now, um, there are, there are lots of other issues which we could go into detail, but I think I, I, can, uh, I can briefly just table one to my recommendations of what needs to be done and what have I recommended in my report. My recommendations are as follows. Uh, I recommend uh, to, the, to the government of Iran to amend Article 13 of the Constitution to ensure that all religious minorities, as well as those who do not hold any religious belief, are recognized and are able to fully enjoy the right to freedom of religion or belief. I recommend uh, that there should be an amendment to all articles in the Islamic Penal Code that discriminate on the basis of religion or belief. I, I recommend uh, an amendment to existing legislation uh, in order to abolish to ensure that uh, the abolish uh, the death penalty for crimes uh, not meeting uh, the most serious crime threshold according to international human rights law. I also recommend uh, that uh, I also recommend the repeal of the established laws and age requirements and any other policies that condition access to employment on the basis of individual relief in line with the constitution. Um, I recommend uh, that um, it should be made sure that all individuals within the, within the territory uh, of Iran and subject to the jurisdiction of the Iranian coast, uh, that all individuals within this territory, within this jurisdiction, are treated equally before the law without distinction of any kind, such as race, sex, language, religion, sexual orientation, or, belief, or other opinion. Uh, I also have recommended in my report that in accordance with Article 18 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which, as you know, in Iran is a party, uh, there should be a commitment that everyone has the right, freedom for conscience and religion, including the freedom to have or to adopt a religion or belief of their choice, or not to have or adopt a religion and free, and, and to have the freedom individually or in community with others, and in public or private, and to manifest their religion or belief in worship, observance, practice, and teaching. I, I have also recommended to the, to the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran to refrain from targeting members of recognized as well as non-recognized religious minorities with national security related charges and end the criminalization of peaceful expression of faith. And finally, I've also recommended to the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran to allow all students of ethnic and recognized as well as non-recognized religious minorities full, complete, and equal access
to state universities on the basis of academic marriage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shea. Hey, Dr. Rahman, sorry. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, we know that with respect to uh, the Baha'is, uh, the Iranian government has a its policies basically are based on the 1991 secret memorandum. And uh, this memorandum is not actually public law, it was uh, divulged, but it delineates the policies implemented by the Iranian government. It's not actually uh, passed by the parliament, it was just passed by the uh, Supreme Council on uh, the Cultural Revolution. And, uh, approved by the Supreme Leader, uh, and it's been implemented to the board, uh, although, you know, uh, and actually the Court of Administrative Justice has referred to that uh, in denying Baha'i students the right to enter universities. Uh, what, what kind of an approach can we take in a situation like this, that we have a law that's not even public, it's a secret law, uh, how do we uh, go about trying to uh, repeal that when the actual government hasn't really officially taken responsibility for it? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think this, um, the 1991 memorandum, uh, we know, as you rightly mentioned, was approved by the Supreme Leader. And the way the Constitution works, it has the official backing in that sense. <laughs> So my recommendation and, and uh, the way I, I see, uh, uh, you know, uh, the way it, 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 we, the Iranian government should now operate is to rescind um, absolutely unequivocally the 1991 memorandum. We know that there, is, there are still policies, uh, administrative and official policies, being pursued under the, this memorandum. So there should be an absolute uh, rescinding it should be absolute, uh, absolutely rescinded and abolished. And uh, the constitution and the legislation should be likewise amended. So all the provisions that are highlighted, all the discriminatory provisions in the constitution, as well as in the legislation and in administrative practices, should be, uh, uh, these uh, discriminatory practices and laws should be abolished. And the government should should uh, come out saying that um, Baha'is are equal citizens and this uh, statement uh, should be reflected both through the law, the legal changes, the constitutional changes, as well as in practice. Uh, I have another question for you, uh, which, you know, it, it's a question for myself all the time. You know, under Article 4 of the Iranian Constitution, uh, all laws should be uh, based on Islamic criteria. And uh, that, of course, is dependent on the interpretation of the six members of the Guardian Council who are appointed by the Supreme Leader. Uh, when we uh, request that or recommend that the Iranian government uh, repeal these discriminatory laws, uh, we are entering a situation that we might be challenging the very uh, foundation, if you might say, of the Islamic Republic because they may believe that these laws define uh, you know, their, uh, the Islamic Republic and, and this form of government. Uh, how can we handle that uh, dilemma in your opinion? Yes, that, that's, a, that's a very important question. Um, well, uh, you mentioned Article 4 and, and the Islamic criteria. And this is, uh, and as you rightly said, this is subject to interpretation of the people who are in charge of uh, the governance of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Now, uh, the answer to this is that if we look uh, more broadly, there are at least 53 states which, uh, in one form or another, uh, they say that they have Islamic credentials. There are many states who, uh, who are absolutely committed to international human rights norms of equality and non-discrimination, as well as uh, delivering the Islamic credential 
Do you understand? So uh, Islam should not be seen as, uh, as a religion that is in any sense incompatible with modern human rights law. So we have to consistently remind uh, the Islamic um, Republic of Iran that there are many states which are Muslim minority that follow the Sharia, and yet they, they have equality on the basis of uh, you know, uh, religion, on the basis of gender, on the basis of sexual orientation. So, uh, so they have to change their interpretation. And as we have seen in the past, that within the Islamic Republic of Iran, they have changed uh, their interpretation. And if there, if, if, uh, if there is sufficient evidence and if there is sufficient bill, uh, that Islamic criterion will be modified to ensure that equal rights of non-Muslims are protected and non-Muslims are equal citizens of Iran. Uh, um, in in uh, response to that point, uh, just briefly, and then we'll go to our other speakers. Uh, in earlier this year, there were a number of uh, court opinions uh, by you know Iranian judiciary, in which they actually the, the opinions were favorable to the Baha'is, for example, and they indicated that, for example, uh, promoting the Baha'i faith is not. Uh, uh, propaganda against the Islamic Republic. So it was, there were like four or five, I think, favorable uh, decisions. And yet, uh, right now, the Iranian parliament is passing a new law, they're considering it, that to specifically, uh, they use the term misguided uh, sect to refer to Baha'is, to specifically prohibit uh, uh, teaching or promoting the Baha'i faith. Or, or any other uh, misguided states, as they refer to. Uh, so as you say, you know, there, there is some possibility within uh, the Iranian judiciary that surprisingly, uh, this was the rulings, they were surprised to me at least. Uh, but at the same time, you see this uh, in, in the parliament. So I, I don't know how that will turn out. I hope that it turns out for the best. Um, yes, I think um, it's unfortunate when these statements like uh, misguided faith or blatant discrimination uh, is, uh, is witnessed against the Baha'is and other religious minorities. We again have to revert to the international human rights obligations that exist. Iran as a state is committed under the, uh, under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights but also as treaties, uh, international covenant on civil and political rights, which affirms absolute equality regardless of religion or belief, uh, as well as that under Article 18 of everyone having the right to freedom of religion or belief. So uh, there is no uh, excuse for any state, uh, including Iran, to find excuses to target uh, particular communities um, such as the Baha'is to say that they are misguided faith. Um, every individual has an inherent fundamental right to freedom of religion or belief, and no state can deny this right. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Rahman. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation and uh, answering my uh, questions. دیگه سخنران این جلسه خانم دایان علایی نماینده جامعه بهایان در سازمان ملل متحد بود که با تشریح وخیمتر شدن وضعیت هموطنان بهایی در ایران گفت رژیم ایران با توجه به تعریف خاصی که از اسلام دارد همه شهروندان را از همان عینک میبیند و به همین دلیل است که گروه هایی که اعتقاد آنها در قالب اعتقاد حکومت ایران تعریف می شود مورد تبعیض قرار می گیرند و به عنوان شهروند درجه دوم و سوم به شمار می uh, sometimes forgotten uh, point uh, on the agenda of the human rights violations in Iran, which is the, the right to freedom of religion and belief. Um, we're very happy, Dr. Rahman, that you have actually decided to focus 
on, really, on the rights of minorities. We report um, um, to the General Assembly and, uh, and we're very grateful um, for your findings and also for your recommendations, which I would also recommend to everyone to really look into and study. This will be a landmark for use in many, many <laughs> uh, months and years um, in the advocacy uh, for the rights to, of religious minorities and particularly um, for the Ba'ids. I think that one of the things that, I mean, a number of things were already um, said in this, um, in, in, in this first segment of the, of the panel about the situation of the Baha'is, I think that one of the um, uh, important points here is to really say that um, uh, it is common, uh, now something that is really accepted very commonly, um, and it was first stated in the case of Iran by uh, Mr. Abdel Fattah Amor, late Abdel Fattah Amor, who was the then Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief, that it is not for a state to decide what is a religion and what is not. And I think that in some ways this is at the, at the crux of the issue of um, the persecution of the Baha'is, where um, the, the Islamic Republic of Iran, which as you very rightly mentioned, uh, Mr. Rahman, um, is not the only state that actually has Islam as its um, uh, state uh, religion, but yet decides that it can only, in its constitution, actually decides what it deems appropriate to be considered a religion and what it doesn't, and, and all the others fall out, including the Baha'is, and therefore that the treatment of its citizens actually go through this lens of being a recognized <coughs> religion or religious minority, or just being an unrecognized um, non um, non-recipient of rights like other Iranian citizens. So I think that this is one of the main um, issues that we face um, and that the Baha'is face in Iran. The second being the 1991 memorandum which you, you referred to, dear Shaheen, um, which, is, which, which actually states how to deal with the Baha'is. And I think that um, although it's a secret memorandum, when Baha'i youth, for example, who do not have access to um, higher education, um, go and, 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 and request um, because they actually pursue, Baha'is have been doing, pursuing um, their rights as Iranian citizens through every means internally. So they go to the office of the registration for the university, they take their cases to the court as you mentioned, the Shahin, and sometimes there are um, um, very good judges that are actually very fair and implement the law in the way that it should be, who actually rule in favor of these Baha'is. Um, but when these students go, um, the response is, well, you know that you know, there is this memorandum for the, from the uh, revolutionary, uh, Cultural Revolutionary Council, and so therefore um, you, know, you cannot go to university um, if you say that you're a Baha'i, which basically forces Baha'is to lie about their faith which is something that they're not prepared to do, of course. Um, the 1991 secret uh, memorandum also states something that has been actually at the core, together with this denial of access to education, <coughs> at the core of the de facto elimination of the Baha'i community as a viable entity, which is the right to have a profession and earn a living. At the beginning of the uh, Islamic Revolution, what the Iranian government did was to actually execute and kill Baha'is simply because of their religious belief. But thanks to the pressure from the international community and from the United Nations, um, this actually killing um, um, has stopped. And, uh, and, but, the, but the Iranian government's policy and goal to eliminate the Baha'i community as a viable entity in Iran has not stopped. And so they have found a way of actually suffocating the community and by, on the one hand, not allowing um, children and students to have access to education, to higher education, therefore really impoverishing um, the quality of their knowledge and the capacity to enter the workplace. Let alone the fact that you can imagine how um, disheartening it is for a young person at the beginning of his or her life to study very hard, 
to reach actually quite high levels. Some of the Baha'i students, you know, in Iran to enter the university, you have to go to a national competitive exam, which ranks you. And depending on your numbers and your rank, you have access to, to various universities. And, uh, and, and some of the Baha'i youth have ranked really very highly in that competitive exam, and yet because they were Baha'is, they were denied to access to university. So imagine you're a young person, you're 17, 18, your life is in front of you, and all of a sudden there is this wall that falls, and that doesn't allow you to be able to look at your future with hope, which every young person should be entitled to. But the other thing about the denial of access to higher education is, of course, the denial of employment. It is very clear from the outset of the, um, of the Islamic Republic, Baha'is were forbidden to enter the public sector. So that, was, that is a complete, um, and it is in the 1991 memorandum. But also um, that they have been prevented from earning a living in the private sector. Um, that is through um, uh, renewal of business licenses, that is through pressures from employers to dismiss <coughs> their Baha'i employees, that is even uh, pressure to tenants um, that Baha'i rent, um, you know, I don't know, for example, uh, a practice from, you know, uh, to, to, to not renew the lease. And finally, the last resort that the, um, that the Iranian authorities have found out is to now close small Baha'i businesses um, because on the pretext that they're closed on uh, Baha'i holidays. Um, now, there are only nine Baha'i holidays uh, in the year. I think that all of us can relate to uh, the two holidays. You know, I don't know, Christians have uh, Christmas, uh, Jews have Yom Kippur, Muslims have, I don't know, Eid al-Adha or Eid al -Gorban. I mean, you know, everyone, in, in whichever religion you are, you have a, a few holidays that you don't work, that work is suspended, and that's very normal. And Baha'is don't have like hundreds of them, it's only nine, um, so it's not such a large number. And when they close their shops, um, it is, uh, they don't advertise that the shop is closed because it's a Baha'i holiday, they just close their shops. And the Iranian uh, legislation also for, um, for, for businesses allows that your shop can be closed up to 15 days without notice. So even they're within the law as well, you know, those nine days. And yet, when sh these shops close on Baha'i holidays, they're sealed. And not only are they sealed, very often the uh, goods inside the shops are confiscated, which is a form of extortion. Um, because these people have, you know, bought these goods, you know, and uh, very legally, and it's their belongings, and yet it is also confiscated by, by the authorities. As you mentioned, the Shaheen, there, there are some courts that have actually judged in favor of the Baha'is and have said that this, 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 um, this uh, closing, this shop uh, ceiling is illegal <coughs> and that the shops should be reopened, but the Baha'is have yet not been able, the authorities not, are, not, are only, even not following the, um, the instructions of the courts and not reopening these shops, which is really uh, incredible that the authorities will not even listen and obey the instructions of the judiciary when it, uh, when it takes uh, in such a position. So really to say that, you know, if you can't go to university and if you can't earn a living, well, how do you live? How do you survive? And now if we look at the very dire economic situation that all Iranians face in Iran at the moment, and you imagine that already the situation is dire for your average Iranian who is trying to make a living and has difficulties, imagine then if you're a Baha'i, what kind of pressure that puts on you, which is, you know, just unbearable. And Baha'is are Iranians. They feel Iranians. They love their country. They want to stay in their country. They don't want to leave. And they want to serve, to be able to work shoulder to shoulder with other fellow Iranians for, from other religions or beliefs, and to <coughs> make a better society and build a better society for all Iranians. This is their goal. And so therefore, it is quite surprising and um, astonishing that um, a government would then persecute uh, its own citizen a government that claims that it has as principles Islamic justice, 
that would then claim that would then persecute um, its own citizen who only are well wishers of their own country. Um, I will very briefly address a number of other points because I've elaborated a bit mm -hmm. too long on these two, so that you have a full picture um, of the of the rest of the persecution of the Baha'i. So you know, aside from these two, which are really at the core of la now the survival of the Baha'i community, of course. Baha'is are not allowed to bury their dead um, in a proper manner. Um, Baha'is uh, cemeteries are de desecrated. Baha'i properties are confiscated. Baha'is, as you know, are not allowed um, all Baha'i holy places because you know that Iran is actually the cradle of the Baha'i faith. Um, um, the Baha'i faith was born in Iran, and so there are many holy places for Baha'is all around the world, not only Iranian Baha'is, but Baha'is from Switzerland, from Africa, from Latin America, from, from Asia. So really it is for all the Baha'is, the specific, all the Baha'is in the world that these holy places have been now confiscated and, and desecrated. And finally, there's a campaign of incitement to hatred in the Iranian media against the members of the Baha'i faith, which depict them, and I know from our colleagues, uh, from the, the, the Sufis and also our colleagues from the New Christians, that this campaign is very, very similar, and I'm sure they will be able to talk about it as well, a campaign of defamation and really incitement to hatred against the Baha'i. And as uh, Mr. Javid mentioned, you know, if you don't have any blood money or desos or diye when you kill a Baha'i, imagine there's a campaign of incitement to hatred against the Baha'is, and if you kill the Baha'i, nothing will happen to you because there is no blood money or kassas. So what kind of, um, what kind of a situation does that give to, to any average Iranian? And then the last word is that in that 1991 memorandum, it stated that um, actually Baha'i, the Baha'i faith will also be destroyed outside of Iran, and this is what Iran is doing at the moment in Yemen. And so Iran is not only satisfied with uh, persecuting and trying to um, uh, de destroy uh, the Baha'i community in Iran as a viable entity, it also uses I its influence on the Houthis in Yemen to also persecute the Yemeni Baha'is. And so now this discrimination and this persecution is not only within the borders of Iran, but it actually is exported to other countries such as Yemen. Thank you. سومین سخنران این جلسه خانم باربرا مسترمن از انجمن جهانی پاسداشت حقوق بشر بود که سخنرانی خود را به نقض مستمر و گسترده حقوق دراویش گنابادی در ایران اختصاص داده بود. خانم مسترمن در ابتدا گفت متاسفانه هرچه پیش می رویم وضعیت حقوق بشر در ایران نه تنها بهتر نمی شود بلکه روز به روز وخیمتر می گرد. و این وضعیت وقتی به تنوعهای قومی و مذهبی میرسد با اینکه اکثر این گروه ها اصولا در سیاست دخالت نمی کنند و خیمتر می شود Um, I would like to thank the um, Iran Human Rights Documentation Center to make this uh, opportunity possible. Um, I would like to uh, use this opportunity to examine the human rights situation in Iran, especially given the 42nd uh, session of UN Rights Council, and foremost uh, discuss the dire human rights situation in regards to the rights of ethnic and um, religious minorities in Iran. Unfortunately, the human rights situation in Iran not only is not improving, but it's steadily deteriorating, especially when it comes to the rights of ethnic and religious minorities even though most of these groups are not involved in any political activities. One only needs to have a brief look at the situation faced by a few religious minorities, such as the Gonabadi Sufis, uh, the Iranian Sunnis, Christian converts and Baha'i citizens, in order to understand the dismal situation they are faced with on a daily basis. For example, let us look at the terrible condition faced by Gonabadi Sufis. 
The Ghanabadi Sufis are one of the largest religious groups in Iran with over 9 million followers and they adhere to both Islam and Shi'ite doctrine. Yet, only because of their different perspective on Islamic teachings, which are based on tolerance and living in peace with others, they face daily persecutions and repression, ranging from imprisonment, torture, to the destruction of their places of worship, execution and slaying under duress. This story of oppression is not only about the Sufis, but also concerns any group of people that don't adhere to the extremist Islamic interpretation of the Iranian government. If we look at the events of the last two years alone, we see that in February 2018, the Sufis who gathered in peaceful protests in order to defend their leader after they became aware of the Iranian security forces plan to arrest their 91-year-old spiritual leader, Dr. Noor Ali Tabande, they encountered the most brutal crackdown of the past decade by the Iranian security forces. More than 800 Sufis were brutally beaten and arrested, one of them, Mohammed Raji, was murdered under torture during that fateful night while the rest of the protesters were targeted with shotgun pellets and bullets, some of whom were then arrested with their bullet wounds left untreated for months without anyone caring the slightest about their well-being. Then, in June 2018, there was the most brutal case of execution of an innocent Sufi, Mohammad Salas, whose case became known internationally and was even mentioned by U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Mr. Salas was executed on trumped-up charges after being falsely convicted in a speedy trial, which took only a few hours, despite the existence of a huge amount of evidence proving his innocence and only after the arrest of his defense lawyer also on false charges. You might also find it hard to believe that the Islamic Republic of Iran, after suppressing the Sufis in just one court session alone, sentenced 200 Ghanabadi Sufis to 1,080 years in prison, 5,995 lashes, and forbade them to leave Iran for 46 years, and exiled them 114 years from their hometowns, and were also barred for 72 years from taking part in any form of social gathering or protests. Moreover, it needs to be said that all these imprisoned men and women Sufis are all kept in the most dangerous wards of the Iranian prison system, together with the most violent offenders who have committed the most heinous crimes. It may be also hard for you to hear that the Islamic Republic has put Dr. Noor Ali Tabande, the 91-year-old spiritual leader, of the Ghanabadi Sufis under severe pressure. Dr. Noor Ali Tabande is a prominent Iranian lawyer who has spent his entire life serving the people. He has been poisoned many times and spends each day in serious danger. His speeches to his students and visits with his supporters and friends are under constant uh, surveillance by the Iranian security forces, who regularly publish false and misleading statements to his followers under the name of Dr. Noor Ali Tabande. Another tactic of the Islamic Republic against the Sufis is to launch regularly propaganda campaigns against those who defend the rights of Sufis. 
During the past two years, hundreds of Basijis from the Revolutionary Guard's office in Mashhad, under the supervision of Mehdi Ta'eb, have launched such campaigns as part of a psychological warfare against the Sufis. For example, by regime's forces who have infiltrated in uh, the Sufi groups. Uh, these attacks are done by those who have infiltrated Sufi groups with the mean to create division, diversion among them and is aimed at tainting Sufism and thus allowing the regime to distort the message of tolerance of Sufism and put further pressure on Gonobadi Sufis. All these measures of oppression through pressure, destruction, destruction of houses of worship, imprisonment, and ultimately execution and torture of the Sufis take place simply because the Sufis believe in an Islam that is based on love, peace, and tolerance, irrespective of faith or belief. As I present to you this report today, there are still 120 Sufis imprisoned under the most severe pressure that also extends to their families. And uh, may I remind you, even though the 91-year-old spiritual leader of the Gonabadi Sufis was recently allowed to return to his hometown after 12 years of exile, he still remains under severe pressure on a daily basis as he is under 24 hours surveillance by the Iranian security <coughs> forces. As I have already mentioned, the Gonabadi Sufi story of suppression is not unique. It is the story of all ethnic and religious groups in Iran who have beliefs that are different to the ideology of the Iranian government. It is also the story of all political prisoners. <clears throat> whose political views are different from those of the Iranian government. It is the story of teachers, workers, nurses and homeowners who only wish to claim their basic human rights. These days, at every corner of Iran, you can hear the voices of protest, which is a bitter, loud and painful tale for all, for all Iranian people but the government's crackdown on its citizen, unfortunately, only further represses the people. That is why all Iranian prisons are filled many times more than their standard capacity. There's hardly a day that goes by when you don't hear news of executions announced by the regime. It is my sincere hope that one day soon I stand here beside you and report on improvements in the human rights situation. But until that day, we must all stand together against the human rights violations of Iran, of the Iranian regime, that is against its own citizens and force the regime to stop its oppressive actions against all sections of the Iranian society. Thank you for listening.